what is going on with all the announcements? I've hired some people to do some work around here. I mean, listen. Next uh, is music. We don't we don't have time to fool around. We've officially been told we need to keep this baby to 30 minutes. We don't have time. Mess. <laughs> don't be angry at the audience. I saw I went to see a comic the other day and there's like, you know, 18 people in the audience. And the guy's like, Oof, uh, what am I? We're here. Get on with your life. That's the worst when a comedian doesn't respect the people that are there. Why are you here? Yeah. People that aren't? It's like, oh my goodness. Well, I'm Melinda McKenzie. I'm Tom Wise. Respect the audience. I respect the audience. We're going to respectfully try to do 30 minutes because we were told that, you know, that needs to happen. So let's see what happens. I'll try to keep my eye on the clock. Um, what topics do you have, kind sir? Hey, do you see my little thing in the back? Can I brag on a little work? Yeah, do it. So the handy tape. I think people like the behind the scenes things a little bit with business. What do you think? Well, I think they're going to have to because that's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, about about six, seven months ago, I brought in this little handy tape. Yeah. From home shopping. Right. Uh -huh. right? And then it was 1995. And then they go ahead. And then, what happens when they launch an item on QVC? What happens? What, a lot happens. What do you mean? Well, although with price wise, it's on the website for 1995. But the first day that it comes out and is greeted by the public, it generally is discounted for a short, for the first three shows will be discounted to $17.95, right? Absolutely, yes. Well, they decided to take the handy tape and have it on the website for $19.95. And the day that I did it back in February, it was $21.95. Nope, that would be the wrong way to go, sir. <laughs> I would say no to that. So we had to sit for 90 days until it was eligible for a discount so that they don't go to 17 they went to 19 which was the original price who who made these decisions what mad scientists were in charge anyway i okay. had um i've always been a, a, the theory that after midnight every half an hour or so your audience is cut in half boom okay. you got it this is just my personal gut then you get to one o'clock you get to 115 you get to 130 in the morning half 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 well, I was on at 1.37 a.m. Okay. <laughs> that's not really that's not really a goal airing for any of us. It's that's we're almost we're 23 minutes away from the end of our broadcasting day. But Tommy Boy brings his A game. And you killed it. Doubled the doubled the amount that they wanted to sell. You killed it. And I then nice and don't you think 4 a.m. is the worst? I feel like 4 a.m. was the worst airing does, time. Does QVC run tape now overnight? They now they didn't use to, but yes, um, they do now. Yeah, that used to be terrible. Uh, but no, I got so now I was part of the taping, so I got aired twice, two more times overnight, which was Very nice. nice. So I ended up selling a lot, not a lot, but you know. Well, so I'll tell everybody what the photos are behind you then, because it's a fix it tape. So something breaks, this is silicone. There's no adhesive on it. Uh huh. Have you seen this thing? Yeah. Only from you. So let's say I take this piece and I've got another piece like this. There's a little black piece and there's a little plastic you peel away from it, right? Okay. So I wanna repair something. It's called self-sealing silicone. Okay. I push them two together or you wrap that on itself. Okay. And within seconds, it instantly starts to bond to itself. Okay. All right. That's very good. So if I was gonna if I was gonna fix a hose or something, I would take the hose that was leaking and I would wrap it on the hose and then it would stop the leak or a pipe. Can you do that for facelifts, I wonder. You know, they have tape for your, for women to Oh, I did it too tight. <laughs> Yeah, so it was a nice, fun little presentation. Very good. Well, tell me what kind of um, fun topics we can squeeze in in 30 minutes. Wow. Are you, how many times are we going to talk about that? Now you're talking about the audience. Now you're talking about the audience. You're talking about the time. Uh, I'm going to talk about it a lot. I'm trying to wrap my brain around it. I mean, I've got, I want to talk about something called whisper listings. Let's do it. Have you heard of? Whisper listings. Is it part of real estate? 
Yes. What's going on? Guess why it's called whisper listings. We we're, we want to keep the minorities away from the neighborhood. So we're just going to tell the white people about something for sale in a nice neighborhood. Think more globally. We Think want to keep all the minorities away. You are digging such a deep hole. <laughs> participate in what you're saying. Think about it. The whisper listings are when really wealthy people are putting, they're, they're really wealthy people are putting their homes up and they don't want people traipsing in, right? They just don't want rando people traipsing in. I've heard of homes here in New York where you have to put a certain money amount down just to even walk in the house because they don't want, which I would do too, right? Um, but they're saying here, uh, not just in New York, but all in the metro cities, they do a whisper listing, which legally, if you want your house to go on the market, you must list it in a public forum within 24 hours. That's the that's le that's the legal ramifications. However, there's a caveat. If you list your home with only one brokerage, then you can keep it on the whisper listings and only let a few people know that you think would want it because you don't want a bunch of strangers in your home, which, you know, okay. I mean, whatever. So in New York, uh, in, in 2018, before the pandemic hit, they said there were 40, 43 homes that sold for more than $20 million. 21 of them were in the whisper listings. That I mean, I think if I had a home worth $20 million, what are you going to do? Open it to the world and have everybody, because the worst part about showing your home, tell me what happened when you open up the ranch. You know, people are walking with their shoes. They're, you have a lot of rooms. You can't guarantee what they're getting into. You would it's missing, them. right. You had a pool pool cue or something was to a pool, uh, a, one of the balls. I declared it was stolen, like everything else that I think is stolen, but stolen. it's not, and it wasn't. Well, I believe you anyway. <sighs> Thank you. So, um, so they're saying that this is kind of an accepted practice among people with a lot of money. And of course, you know, I don't have that kind of money, but I, I got to, I respect that. Well, yeah. Well, if I was owning the house and I hired a broker, I would make them pre-qualify anybody that stepped in the house. I think you know, that we're, not, we're not having an open house where you're cooking, uh, making cookies and uh, Yankee candles. Right. We're going to, you got to pre-qualify anybody that comes in the front door. What do you, what would be the, what's the number? One million? Like at what point do you go, look? Well, no, no, I, I want, I want the guy to prove that he's able to financially buy the house, you know, G you know, give me a statement like from a bank or from a lending company saying he's approved up to $28 million. And you got oh, that, wow. you've got, you got the paperwork, come on in, have a yeah. look see. But so, you know, we're looking at houses and we're looking at a lot of different locations. So I want to, Hopefully you can see this. And for anybody that's on um, iTunes, I'm showing a home that's in Chicago. Oh, that's where uh, the Munsters lived. <laughs> this house is, okay, you're going to love to, first of all, it has, um, hold on. I want to tell you how, how many bedrooms and baths. Are you ready Are for Are you that? moving to Chicago? I'm looking. I'm looking at Chicago. Wow, how exciting. That's a great town. I love Chicago. Yeah. Um, my daughter and her boyfriend want to live. I'm I'm not so sure, but I told them I would look. This house has 12 bedrooms and six bathrooms. 6,270 square feet. Guess what they're asking? They just dropped the pot, the price by 24K. Okay, what's the suburb? I don't know. It's on Garfield Boulevard. I don't know the suburb. Oh, it's probably Chicago. It's yes, it's definitely Chicago, but I don't know what part of Chicago. Right, Garfield is a kind of a medium south side that looked like an old building. That's probably uh, is the building what 1920. Let me tell you the history because this may this is why I wanted to show this to you. This is the famous O'Leary Mansion. Do you know what that what the O'Leary Mansion is? Yes, so the cow that kicked and kick started the Great Chicago Fire. James O'Leary had this mansion built for his mother, Catherine O'Leary, whose cow allegedly started the Chicago Fire. Please, we've got the hoof prints on the lantern. Here is your opportunity to own a piece of Chicago history with this magnificent property. It was recently featured by Crane's Chicago Business and multiple times on Channel 11 and PBS. Well, the Channel possibilities 11, it, are endless, but it needs some TLC. Oh, that means the wiring and the pipes are bad. It needs some TLC. It says this is a multi-million 
dollar mansion. It has some fantastic original woodwork and moldings, four levels, four levels. How are they spelling molding? Like they like mold in the ceiling or mold <laughs> in the walls? It says it has extra large rooms. I don't know what this is Two. Oh, I guess this guy's name was Jim. Two of Big Jim's walk-in vaults. Walk-in vaults, I want this. We always we always blame the missus for that cow. It Well, yes, because it said it was his mother's cow, Catherine. Mrs. O, Mrs. O'Leary. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Um, it says there's also a huge two-story coach house. But remember, this is selling as is, everybody. Right. And now, guess the price. Your price I, that I can negotiate yes. is going to be uh four million five hundred thousand dollars right now they did drop at 24k okay four million three hundred okay wait i want to see it the year it was built was 1890 yikes 1890 um i wonder why it didn't burn is it is it limestone? Uh, sir, you're asking me questions I don't know. I'm just saying famously, the only buildings in Chicago that withstood the fire were the limestone, you know, water tower of downtown Chicago. Well, I told Alex we could look at it. <laughs> I said, we're going to well, look at so it. Well, you're so handy. I don't know why, you even, why you're even hesitating. I told her we would have to have a contractor live with us and we could let him live for free while he works on the mansion because I, you know. Is there an offer of sex involved as well for the contractor? At this point in my life, I doubt that that would be. No, please, believe me, the contractors that are not getting it at home. Go on. <laughs> it's only 475,000. 475, that's it. Why? It says in, in capital letters, this is a multi-million dollar mansion. 475, please. I, I don't disagree with that. And the right person can flip that thing. But let me just tell you, it's going to be a mess unless, unless it's been renovated. I mean, well, you it's- No, yes. 1890, all the upgrades you would have to do. But I still want to look. I think it's kind of fascinating. You might have, that thing might have a coal chute. <laughs> you know what? I think it says what it has. It has to say, it says it has natural gas. Okay. And there is one window unit. I've got natural <laughs> gas. Go on. How am I like an antique house? I've been looking at the square footage. Do you know what houses are selling in Florida? What's your square footage price there? Um, let's see. Um, $20, $30 a square foot. In Florida, that's it? I don't know. Oh, it's got to be more than that. Let me check. Because like in New Jersey, it's over a hundred, and in Manhattan, it's like over a thousand. Um, because the the price per square foot on this house is only seventy six dollars, which is stunning. Yeah. So, I'm gonna look. Who knows, right? Maybe it'll turn. Uh, to that would be marvelous. But house please, of my it probably needs, you know. Five hundred thousand dollars worth of work. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Like, would we be able to live in part of it? Yeah, and just do bits and pieces. Oh yes. You know, let me also say that unless you're really used to this, there's a window that people will work like crazy for six months on the house, and they're like, "And we're done, and yeah. it's not, and it's not finished." Yeah, I told her. I said, with twelve bedrooms, we could actually have a whole other family live with us and maybe barter and never see them. The contract work and right, we would never see them. So. I just thought it was hilarious because we're looking at all this the spaces. That's like I, fun. That's would be yeah, a fun I idea. Earlier, there, every time I start looking for a place, there's something wrong with that. Like New York, tax is too high. It's that, uh, let me just sound a bit of an alarm. It might you might have a location, location, location situation too. Meaning, it's not it's, in the city. There aren't any. Oh, this is the mansion area. If you're not on the water in the city is very rustic. Yeah. I yeah. mean, when, when Alex and Will lived there, I did recognize it was very much a miss. There would be a glorious Victorian home. Right. And then there would be apartments that looked really not great. Yeah. So, you may or may not have gentrification in the area where this is located. Yeah. 
So that's a fun little thing, but I had never heard of a whisper listing. So this no. is not a whisper listing. So someone like me can actually look at it. Absolutely. That's nice. Yeah. So, yeah. so good. Well, you're so, used to living amongst the people. I am the people. I am the people. When I first moved to New York in 2013, the neighborhood I moved in, I was very clearly the first white woman that was there. I got a lot of attention and none of it was good. <laughs> I had people come up to me and tell me to get out. That they get didn't, out. They didn't want me in their neighborhood. When I went to the local grocery store, um, because there were a lot of uh, Jamaican women that you know didn't want gentrification, didn't want someone like me raising the rent. I would be in the grocery store and they would go, you get out of here. You do not belong here. Go home. And I was like, have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. So um, I got harassed a lot, but you know what? It flipped within a year and it's not because of me. It's because they started cleaning up the area. People, it was too expensive to live anywhere else. I got quite a deal. And even when I moved in then in 2013, my apartment, it was a three bedroom, but it was like, oh, like $2,600. So for New York, that's insanely cheap. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So maybe I'll be living in the O'Leary's mansion. <laughs> That'd be, I would love, I personally would love that, but it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like a lot of work, but I like adventure and I like having stuff to do. I mean, so, so you're, you're into the thing for a million bucks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I would just, well, yeah, that sounds like fun. So I do have a bunch of other questions, but I want to know what you want to talk about because no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I let me let me check my phone to see if I had any check your phone interesting topics that I wanted to attack any interesting topics because we're going to be almost at our thirty minutes already. Well, I tell you this, I'm getting odd calls. I you know I told you I was a uh, quiz master. I received my quiz master certification. Oh no, do you have stalkers already? Today? About a month ago. And they don't have any work for me. And I've, I've, I've come almost become, you know, unexcited about it. Yeah, why, what's the hold up? Why wouldn't they rotate you well, in? Well, they've got, no, once you get a gig, it's your gig. They don't, they don't rotate you in and out. So they look after they get a quiz master, they look for, you know, golfing places, you know, retired communities. So then they start the phone call. So it's a process. Yada, yada. All right. The guy keeps on calling me for everything. It's like, well, let me just tell you the 19 calls I made today and the meeting I had. I said, I'm not interested in any of that stuff. I'm interested in you calling me saying we got a gig. I don't care about your process. What? Well, I don't understand. So is he getting a stipend for making all these phone calls? No. And so he's just, he's just reporting the progress. He's oh. yesterday at eight 30, I'm out having dinner. I, the phone rings. It's him. I go, Hey Mac, I may call you back. I text him. Okay. You know, I want I'm not trying to be rude. Yeah. And then, of course I don't call him back because I was drinking. And then this morning, I wake up, he's calling me at nine o'clock. Oh, hey, what's going on, Adam? Oh, let me just tell you. Well, you know that thing you talked about? That's not going to happen. Uh, I go, why are you calling me with any of this stuff? Yeah, that I don't know. Who? I, yeah. I said, he needs to get a dog or a, a fake girlfriend, funny. Jamaican girlfriend. You know what? That reminds me of a funny meme I saw yesterday, which was, um, it, it basically said, if I drunk text you and you yeah. don't answer, in the I'm morning, coming. don't call me back because it's a whole new day and I'm walking with the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my drunk text you, you don't answer. It's done. It's over. We have a new day. The sun is shining. We will not speak of this. <laughs> there are windows. There are, windows there are closed. definitely windows. And you know, the old saying goes is like, you know, you, you hear a lot of women say, well, don't call me when you're drunk. But then you hear the other side of it is, People are more vulnerable when they're drunk. And I feel like they text people that they actually really do want to spend some time. You know what truth I mean? Serum. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that someone's reaching out when they're drunk. I think it just kind of says when they're, you know, feeling more able to be vulnerable that you're the one. Let me ask you a question. We had a conversation about this the other day with a buddy of mine. Yes. Um, one of the fears of a regular man is that you'll be looked at as being an idiot. My sister tells a story. My sister's four years older than I am. We worked at the ABC office machines 35, 40 years ago when we were youthful in our, in our 20s and 30s, okay? There was an old technician that was hired to work on machines, you know, typewriters back in the old days in the 80s and when people would, would fix it. This guy was like 
grandpa age. My yeah. sister's 35, <laughs> 34, right? So years after, you know, the shop shuts down and people go their separate ways, she gets a letter from this guy saying, you know, I've told my wife about you and I think she's comfortable with us having a relationship. Like, are you out of your mind? Yes. So he's, he was just thinking this whole time that you know, he had a shot at my sister and he's 40 years older than she was. So he's got this thing in his head. And, and it's like, so long story short is he said he was having some texting back with a woman that was a little bit younger than he is, like 15 years. And, but he doesn't know this person. And should he, you know, hey, should we go out for a drink? <clears throat> but doesn't want this other person to say, oh, no, I was just being nice. So I, there's no drinking involved. Um, so the question is, the question is, see, this is now, you know, does he sit on his hands or does he make a move? Because once you, once you said, once you send the, let's go out for a drink that it's all, and it's rebuffed, it's all over. You no longer have a light and lovely, friendly relationship. You know, it, so this morning, you know, I'm alone a lot. So I have a lot of random thoughts. (laughs) And so this morning as I'm doing things and thinking about moving and houses and all the things I, I had the random thought of, you know, testosterone does a lot for you guys. Testosterone makes you brave, makes you take chances, makes you do, you know, things that women, because we don't have that high level of testosterone and it unfortunately makes you more sure of what your draw is. Your delusions. Yes. Yes. And it reminds me very much of when a couple of years ago, when I was selling so much at QVC, I actually was living in Pennsylvania and I had to take my shoes to get my shoes fixed. So I found this old cobblestone, this old shoe. It was very, it was adorable until I met this man. He had to be in his eighties. He was hunched over. He was, you know, like this. Now here's the thing. I'm not saying I'm the hottest chicken on the planet, but I'm not in my eighties. And I walked in and I'm nice and I smile. And sometimes when oh, I smile- Oh, you're flirting. Go on. Sometimes when I smile, this means I want to fuck you. It's very confusing for men to see the smile and not think that I want to fuck them. So I'm smiling, I'm talking and he leans in, he goes, oh, you know, he's just starts saying, oh, and you know, you're beautiful. And at first I'm like, oh, that's, you know, sweet, right? 80 year old. Your grandpa saying you're pretty. Wait. Then as we're talking about these little shoes I'm getting fixed, he's like, Melinda, because you know, he went to my name. He goes, you come, you come by later, we'll have a drink. We'll talk. He goes, you're so beautiful. He goes, you know, I've been alone a long time. He starts, what, what? At that point, I'm thinking, keep my shoes. I don't care anymore because why are you assuming? He didn't ask me. He didn't say, are you interested? He was more like, yes, we're doing this. So the same thing with, with this guy is if, if he's willing to understand what you said, which is you could be rebuffed and then the whole friendly thing is over it's over because once once the shoe guy asks you out for a drink we're no longer grandpa friendly stranger and what makes him he's, think he's shot he's shot his shot what what makes him think that he's in the running that's my question like really men have to think about well that. he it's interesting because i i i he sent me the text conversation that he had with this woman it was very friendly very you know nice but she liked you know, drops in a hug emoji. And I, I, there was either one of my, my uh, brother's son's girlfriend who was in her twenties. She was there as I was, you know, I like, you know, this is you and me, we like unpacking shit. Let's peel back, you know, what's really happening. What is it she, she thought, Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's a go. That's green light. Yeah. You know, I would send a hug emoji to someone that I wasn't interested in. I wouldn't do that. So the, is the hug the key? Well, I think that's one of the, the subtle hints. I would take that as a subtle hint, the uh, hug emoji. But it's, we're so fearful of being like acting, looking the fool, like the shoemaker or the typewriter guy. No, I get it. We're but then only- without any risk, there's no reward. Right. So, I mean, I get- but but the, does the guy have to risk being a fool? Is there no third option of having an intermediary? You know, there's type- always a third option. Why can't he just say in the text, Hey, I'm interested in going out 
on a date and if you're not that's fine at least you clear the air so she could here's the thing now she can think you're the fool what is he crazy i'm 15 years i could be his daughter women are able to say those things and to still be friends with a guy guys don't want to be friends with women unless they can have sex with us that's not true that is it is true i know you have a lot of female friends but it's rare I'll, most men do not want to just be your friend unless they can get some sex out of it that's just how many guys do you know have a lot of female friends not a lot i mean that's been my personal experience and what do i know i'm just a girl right i mean it's all it's all the blind men and the elephants right yeah, touching the different parts, figuring out what they got. It's always your perspective of whatever the, the reality is. You know, it, like you said, you got to take a risk if you want a reward. Right. I mean, you don't live your life regretting because, you know, worst case scenario, she says no and gets put off. But why waste your time? If that's what he really wants, What? why do that? You know, because then it just blows up everything. Then you're you're putting in a box as a weirdo. Because you are, because you're a weirdo. Deal with it. <laughs> no, I get why men are afraid of, you know, being vulnerable like that, because all we have to worry about is being murdered and raped. So I totally get the fear of being embarrassed. It makes sense to me. But there's a real fear. We've come to a, an interesting impasse. <laughs> I think he should take the risk. She sent a hug emoji. And I think that's above and beyond a friendship. I would say go for it. All right. I will advise thusly. Yeah. No chick is sending you a hug emoji if they're just like, oh, we're friends. And if she is just friends and she sends them a hug emoji, then she's sending mixed signals as far as I'm concerned. All right. So that's you know? on her. If he, yeah. if she, if she at the end discovers him and identifies him as a weirdo, it's on him or her. Her. And, and, and here's the great thing. What if she really is interested? Then this is a shot, man. Be wonderful. Yeah. Do it. I mean, I I feel like the whole dating thing is hard enough. And if he feels like he's found someone, at least try. Yeah. You know, I know we've gone past the 30 minutes that our friends want. Wow. Makes me really sad. Let's do another. You know what? F them. Let's get a shirt. <laughs> F you. F you. We can't have this. Tom and I cannot be held back. We That's can't. We're don't... peacocks. We've got a preen. We gotta go. We gotta 30 minutes. We can't say hello in 30 minutes. Uh, I mean, we're much more interesting than that. What are yeah. you talking about? It, I'm sure you've taken four me. naps ever since we started the show. How many, how many people do you have a 30-minute conversation with and you walk away satisfied? That's not a lot of conversation if you're digging into some stuff. We're unpeeling and packing shit. We're packing some shit. Well, so, all right. So let me ask you this. I just started thinking about once we're going out in the world, right? I don't know how it is in Florida, but people are slowly creeping out. You know, we're getting to the end of had it, having the second shot and trying the world. And um, I was out in the world today, had to take the cat in for some, just some blood work and stuff. And I did show Tom this funny picture and I'm going to show it again. And then you, you tell everybody what you said when I showed it, because it's very true. So for anybody on iTunes, this is, I never oh, yeah. know, Blair, Jeez. the cutest picture of two adorable little twins with their masks, their matching shoes, their matching sunglasses. And I said, Tom, look at this. Even the little kids in Brooklyn outside still wearing masks. And what did you say when I showed you that picture? I said, I cannot, I could not take that picture. <laughs> I'd be arrested. Right. I'd be in jail. It's true. And you know, even as a man, because as a woman, I can freely say, what sweet little girls. How beautiful. Oh, right? my God. They'd be nine, one. Say one more thing, old whitey, and we're going to have a... Yeah, you can't. I mean, you just can't because it, no. it would it would appear and, and feel very creepy. So anyway, I started thinking about getting back out in the world and meeting people and having conversations because I think you and I both agree. We don't want... What do you do for a living? We, all that's boring. Say something to interest me to make the conversation feel more stimulating, right? Like, I feel like if I met someone out in the world for the first time, they're like, what do you do for a living? I, I think I'd punch them in the throat and leave. I don't have time for that. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. But, I, you know, we want an interesting conversation. You know, many I'm a, kidding. Many a truth is said in jest. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Partially true. There's been a lot of moments lately. I want to punch people in the throat. Not necessarily because of that, just because of other things. Right. 
So um, we talked earlier before we started recording about how we both love the idea of like, tell me something good that happened to you. Today, right. Right. Good conversation starter. I still think that you could use that in many different scenarios, talking to your kids, talking to a peer, talking to someone on a date. What a great fun way. What a great, to start, no, we're not right? going to talk with those people have to be politics. You know, you talk about how you just had another grandchild or you got a raise or something, yeah. you know, you finally so, didn't win that lottery. On the latest Saturday Night Live, I know you don't really watch it anymore, but on the latest Saturday Night Live, they did a funny, funny sketch on different ways people are going to come back out into the world and how they're going to relate to each other. And one was a party scene. Oh, and it just, it was hilarious because you know, there's a man and a woman there, you know, they look at each other and she goes, oh, well, that pandemic is really crazy, right? And he goes, yeah, crazy. And they don't know what else to say because wh where does that go from there? Yeah, no one liked the, the pandemic. It was crazy. But something that I wouldn't mind talking about, if, if I was at a party and it was like, oh, that's crazy, I wouldn't mind someone saying, well, did you learn anything about yourself during this? pandemic i think that's an interesting question i i would have that conversation mm -hmm. because then that leads to oh you know what here's what i did with my time or i learned you know i'm i'm really good at you know playing music or whatever so yeah do you feel like during the time of the pandemic which i keep saying it's over i know it's not but for the most part people are going back into the world people are traveling europe's open do you feel like you learned anything specific about yourself because this was such a different time in our in our lives you know, I think there's a bit more gratitude for the un little universe that I've been happily connected to. I was very grateful that the kids weren't that far away. My ex wasn't that far away, so I could go visit the kids and have a little. I felt really bad for people that were just isolated. I mean, we were locked down hard for six months. Yeah. You know, and if you yeah. lived in a, like, oh well, my gosh, people who lived in New York, you couldn't leave the building. Yeah. It's insane. At least I'm out. I was at the ranch and I could walk around and, you know, feed the horses. So my life didn't seem all that completely different outside of not going to home shopping. But, you know, I had a little sphere of people, you know, I enjoyed doing our podcast. That was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think a bit more just gratitude. I didn't learn any additional skills. I didn't read anymore or play anymore. You know, I think people yeah, I locked down and had their Netflix things and whatever. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely learned that I don't mind being alone. I mean, Will and Alex were here, so we definitely, it was nice just knowing people were here, whether we had deep conversations every day or not, right? Just right. other bodies around, just touch and base. We're lucky. Right? Yeah, I felt really lucky because I had the best of both worlds, which was I was allowed to have my alone time, but I also was working, so I had to gear up and get dressed. And something do to do. Something to do. Yep. You and I had the podcast, so it made me creative. I had to think about topics. So I felt like for me personally, the pandemic was good for me as far as living my life. I mean, I definitely, the caretaker in me came out in a really big way. Like I was very checking on people, worrying about people, seeing what people needed. I felt, I felt very much like, what can I, you know, cause I was so grateful right. that I was safe. Like what, what can I, what can I do to to help other people. But you know, the other thing I really learned, and I think I always knew this, but also it just hit me so hard watching here in New York, we're such a uh, tourist area. We rely a lot on Broadway, on, you know, people visiting our city, on restaurants. And a lot of people lost their jobs here because all that stopped, right? All service, all creative, all talent related. Yep. Concerts. Really, yes, concerts. It really embedded in me because I was very fortunate to work and I had less things to spend my money on because I I wasn't doing anything how I know you that cliche we've all heard the cliche you know oh money doesn't buy everything and yeah right but money solves a lot of fucking problems a lot of the days when we're feeling like wow we've been in this house for a long time guess what we bought a car and not only did we buy a car we had the car delivered to us with Carvana because that was a service. I said no more ads for Carvana. <laughs> God dang it. If I didn't have money, I could not have done that. Of course. Yeah. You get to you get to subscribe to all your favorite Hulu's and Netflix's and Amazon's. You get you get to pipe in all that entertainment versus somebody who doesn't have internet. Could you imagine not having internet? Oh. No. 
I, I was able, you know, we have all the internet services and if we wanted sushi, guess what? We ordered it. It came to our house because we live in a city where we're trying to. So I felt very lucky and it really did just impress upon me as much as I don't like to focus on money and I never look at people based on their money. Money is such a source of security for life. And when something like this happened, I'm so grateful because right. I've been poor plenty of times in my life. I've been really down and out plenty of times in my life. I'm so grateful that during this time, I actually had a job. I felt safe. I was able to stay inside my house. I was not a essential worker where I had to go out. I didn't have right. to ride the subway. Oh. Right. So for me, it really taught me like, and that money thing, I've never really put a lot of thought into my, oh, down the road, you know, what am I going to live on? And I was like, you know what, man? It really opened my eyes to how secure I felt knowing I could buy dinner. I could pay for my internet. I could get a car because I, I wanted to get out of the house. Like I felt so lucky. So I'm curious what other people that really were in the circumstance of couldn't go anywhere, lost their job. I, I mean, you read stories in New York all the time. People were in their apartments, couldn't pay the rent, but we, we still have a, a moratorium on eviction still. That's still going on. But at what point do you hit yeah. the wall? Now you're now you're 18 months in or 60 months in. You owed $3,800 a month, $4,200 a month. You owe 40, 50 grand. You can't. Where's that money coming from? And then plus yeah. the guy, the poor guy that lost all that money was <clears throat> he had to pay his mortgage somewhere. Right. Yeah. It's all all bad. Yeah. Have you come across anybody that's talked to you about the pandemic that it really changed them? That they oh I am now a musician or I've you know become a vegetarian like. Have you come across that? It's funny. Uh, no, but Steve Laszlo said that he started the open mic after he had a uh, uh, a health scare. I mean, he took, was taking mixed medicines and they were contraindicated and he fell into a, a, a you know, had a, a an episode. Had he not done anything immediately with a, you know, an ambulance and things like this, he would yeah. have been dead. Yeah, that's they, scary. They caught him on the end. He was still in the hospital for two weeks before he could get out. But he That's goes, cool. he goes, that put that changed his mindset about okay, let's let's do stuff yeah. we want to do. Oh, is he okay now? Mm -hmm. All right, that's scary. Still has the bad attitude, but well, that's what we like about Steve. <laughs> that's our favorite thing about Steve. Um, well, so what goes along with the lines of like, tell me some good news? I think another good question, or for me, an interesting question would be if someone would ask me, what what surprises you? Are there things out there that that surprise you? like in a good way. Can you think of things that you're like, oh, nice. what a nice surprise. Hmm. Do you, would you like surprises, Tom? I do, surprises keep things interesting. I like surprises, not everybody likes surprises. You know, people feel like that's a little too much. <laughs> I definitely have some people that I know, my daughter's one of them, don't surprise me. Don't have really? people sing at a restaurant to me. But do you think they really like it in their in their heart of hearts, or do they really hate it in their heart of hearts? She hates it. Hates it. Doesn't like the attention. Doesn't she likes a certain amount of control and a surprise means zero control. No, thank you very much. So yeah, are there things out there that you've been like, oh, what a nice surprise? I saw the full moon yesterday. Wow, that's lovely though. That was yeah, a nice you surprise. Know. You're not counting on it. But it's full to die. I think yesterday was close. You know what? That's funny you say that. Because listen, we always know there's going to be a full moon. That's normal. But I'm always delighted when I see it. Yeah, it's like, oh, look <laughs> at the big flashlight in the sky. Yeah. No, unfortunately, that means for the Earth's energy, it's actually a very chaotic time. There's, you know, if you believe in all that, which I do, and the energy around you and the energy of the planets, it, it's called retrograde and things are in retrograde. So, and today's Wednesday. Today is like the worst day for the retrograde where you're supposed to not make any decisions, don't sign any contracts, like really? just let things roll off to your back. So yeah. Interesting. Cause I'm a, it's funny. I was talking to Patrick about this. I said, I don't, I'm not a huge astrology believer or whatever, but it's interesting how all of a sudden things that have been blocked are flowing. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it's energy, energy yeah. matters. We don't hey. talk enough about it. You know, are you familiar with B&H Photo? Yes. Yes, I bought things from there. Alex used to be a big photographer. Yeah. I mean, they've got a whole city block in New York, two-story building. Yeah. So yeah. They, e they emailed me yesterday. They want to carry the cart. 
That's great. That would be That's amazing. Exciting. Okay. That's very exciting. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Yeah, so oh, we're still that. we're working on that. Talk about good news. Well, so if you were at a party and you were, you met a lady and she said, "Hey, what surprises you?" Would you? I I have to say my 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 lately my surprises are in, not good. They're politically based. Like uh -huh. really, I thought you were a reasonable person. You still think that? That's those are my recent surprises. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm still I'm still surprised by the political stuff with people. I have to say, so I'm I'm learning to be strong and not engage because I recognize me with my little opinion has nothing to do with nothing. I'm not changing anything. So it has changed the way I look at other people, though. I will say I've had a few instances, you know, when the whole Palestine Israel thing happened, and I was sharing information about what was going on. I I definitely had some uh, Jewish friends in my life come after me and say, how dare you support Palestine? I'm like, I'm supporting human rights, dude. I'm not anti-Jewish people, but I'm also not anti, because they were saying, well, they've done terrorist attacks. They, I'm like, the women and children that are being killed, I don't believe are part of a terrorist group. I think these are just people that are a part of a, a group that are, they've been known historically to do it, but the wrong people are being killed here. And they were very upset with me that I was supporting Palestine when I was trying to let them know I'm supporting human rights. Like that's that's a tough that's a tough situation. I'm almost I'm almost so ignorant that I'm not, I don't even allow myself to have an opinion on it. I clearly my basic opinion is let's yeah. not drop rockets on each other. Yeah. Okay. Let's can we figure this out? But I mean, it's so convoluted. They've been doing this for seventy years. It is convoluted. And and when I posted it, I said, listen, just here's what I'm seeing. Tell me. I'm not claiming to know anything. Historically, I've never invested in Israel and Palestine. So what's going on? And of right. course, I heard from people that were Palestinians saying, yes, this has happened a long time and they're killing our people and they're dividing us up. And, you know, and then my Jewish friends were like, you're an anti-Semite. How dare you? I was like, okay, well, there sorry. You that's... Yeah. Hmm. Well, so that surprises you... me. Yeah. Do you, have any, <laughs> do, you have a, do you have any positive surprises? Okay, well, let me ask you this. If you were at a party, you met someone and part of the conversation was, hey, what are you looking forward to? Have you got things that you're looking forward to? I think that's always important to have something on the calendar. I've got my Baldy Hill climb coming up in uh, September. And are you bringing anybody? So far, no, but I'm inviting the family to come. Yeah, Tommy's gone, right? Yeah, Tommy's gone. I mean, but I've... I've but I've always toyed with the idea of having an open invitation for all my brothers and sisters who have never been there. That would be sweet. Get a big house for a couple of days. I'm looking forward to finally getting this order finished with the carts, factory stuff. It's very close. Yeah. So yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. Looking forward to going out on a boat. Pat says the boat's running well. Let's I get the boat up. We're, we got boating days. No? What's that? You, I thought you were going to sell it. I thought you were talking about I know Pat's reinvigorated on it now. All right, good. I'm looking forward. I'm. I just signed up for a comedy contest next Thursday night. I'll be in a contest. Good. You know, just uh, yeah, stuff like that, little things. No, but I I think it would be an interesting way to know someone if you're at a party and then you could ask her what she's looking forward to and it gives you an insight into what she's about, right? Absolutely. Yeah. What are you know hobbies? Yeah. What's your what are you playing? I mean, you got a kayak trip. You've got you know tennis match, pickleball. There you go, pickleball. <laughs> All of those things. Um, so there was one more I really wanted to ask you. Oh, I think this is interesting, Tom. Is there something that you think people don't know about you that you would like for them to know about you? Mm. It's interesting. I think the short answer is, is probably no. I mean, okay. if somebody, you know, I don't really care about, I mean, I just want to be a, you know, positive influence on people. If, and yeah. It's people, they're coming at you, they're coming at you from all sorts of where they're at is most important. Yeah. So I don't think that I, I affect anybody in really a strong way. And it's like, you know, I don't worry about how people see me. The old four agreements kick in. I can't, yeah. I can't affect how they think. I think 
because of whatever my life, I've told you this before, people in my life, they either really love me, like love me in such a big way that it, it's just glorious. I have friends that love me in such a big way or the other side. I have people that would love to see me dead that if they heard that I died, they, they wouldn't be sad about it. Wow. And yeah, but you know, that's okay because you know what? I take strong stands on things. I, I, I don't, I'm not sweet and like, I'll tell you exactly what I feel, but I'm not gonna tell you how to feel, Right. but I will tell you how I feel. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I like that. Yeah. And so I think, I think the thing that people don't know about me that they, they, I think, you know, everybody, we, we make stories in our heads about people. Right. Mm -hmm. And honestly, whatever people say about me, I literally don't care. I used to care a lot when I was younger, but I recognize that what you said, it has to do with them. So cool. If you like me, that's really nice. But if you don't, I'm also not going to worry about you too much because I feel like I'm amazing. And so if you don't like me, I'm sad for you. I'm really sad for you. But here's one thing I think that people don't understand about me because I'm always trying to be very like, oh, look at this. I'm on the subway and someone shit themselves. Isn't that something, you know, and, and I, I don't, you know, grouse about it. Right. I'm not like, can you believe this motherfucker shit himself? Like, you know what? I don't know his life. Maybe something terrible happened to him and this was the only private place he could go do that. I don't know. But I think the thing that people don't know about me is because I have a tendency to be more, uh, I appear carefree. I think people think I'm a pushover because I have, I do. Right. That's one of my favorite sayings is don't confuse kindness for weakness. Yes. Just because of some of the instances that happened in my life where people try that little like oh oh here let me no i'm nice and i'll love you but if you do something terrible i will turn on a dime your what head. are you what are you the guy on the, on the phone call i don't know who you are i don't know where you're at i've got a certain set of skills well I, you and i have talked about this i've had instances in my work life where people are so nice and then the next thing you know they're trying to take your job like that kind of a thing because well, you think I'm going to be cool with that? I had to work just as hard to get my job as anybody else. I'm not going to bend over and go, yes, I'm so nice. Let me help you. So I think that's something that people don't know about me. I think people think I'm a pushover because I'm super nice. Like I was looking at some of my memories on Facebook and I was talking about this homeless guy that I ran into and I was sharing the story because I found it fascinating. And all the comments were, you be careful. Don't get too, like people were telling me how to behave. Like, oh, do you really think I'm going to walk into a tunnel with this guy? Like, I'm not stupid. I just think it's intriguing that his clothes are made up of fabric right. that he found around his body. Like, there I, you go. You know. I, I, was, I was part of an ultralight club on Facebook. Yeah. And some guy, it, these are very fundamental rudimentary vehicles where it's like a go-kart with a fan and a parachute in the back and you're up flying yeah. and you know it's not like you're flying a 747 right and so this guy just takes a picture of his thing he goes hey and some people will fly these without getting professional lessons okay they'll watch youtubes nobody wants to kill themselves no. they'll watch youtubes to buy it you can buy one of these things for you know eight thousand dollars or whatever and he's like hey i was you know i was test i was doing some couple of dry runs with my machine and I'll be damned, I was feeling it and I just gunned it and I, so I took off and I did a couple of loops and had a landing, you know, it was a blast. I had a great time, right? Yeah. FAA regulation states without an end number and communications with the tower, your flying was illegal and blah, blah, blah. I said, calm down. The guy was in the middle of Idaho <laughs> in a pasture, you know, 17 feet off the ground and people right. can't, you know, and it was one regulation violation after another with this wow. guy. It's like, calm down. Don't you guys just love the, the, the Wright brothers didn't have any end numbers or they didn't talk to the tower. Yeah. They just wanted to get up in the air. Yeah. <sighs> well, and definitely if you're at a party and you come across that type of person, like I go the other way, cause I'm not, I'm yeah. not. Go figure people. somebody else out. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, my name's Tom Wise. And I'm Melinda McKenzie and you have unpacked an hour's worth of shit with us. <laughs> I think, I don't even know. That's we're doing fine. Let me give it. Here's the tip of the day. Don't forget to stretch. You never regret stretching. Did you look on your Instagram? I sent you that guy's information, how to stretch. No, I'm never on Instagram. I'll check I it. No, you're never on Instagram, but it, you're Tom Weiss comic, right? Yes, I, I am.
that's I, who I, I my answer to that. <laughs> well, that's who I sent it to. I know you don't really have anything on there, but I've sent you a few messages I know you've never looked at. So check have out the guy. He's very have you found me on TikTok yet? I haven't been on TikTok yet because the minute I open that floodgate, you won't see me for a while. And then the <laughs> next thing you know, I'm going to be doing dancing TikToks and humiliating my family. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's another time. Well, I'll save that topic for the next show. I've okay. Got All right. To say about that. All right. And uh, well, you, you've been unpacking some shit. Keep it down out there. We're still internationally podcasting. <laughs> oh, he's just trying to ruin the end of our show. Dang it. He could have waited 30 seconds. It would have been fine. No. All right. See you Friday. Bye, love. <laughs>